Hello, everyone. Welcome to this Young Achievers Symposium organized by the Center for Socially Response AI at Penn State University. Today, we are delighted to have Pranice Vepercoma as our guest speaker. Pranice is currently a PhD student at MIT. His research focuses on developing algorithms for distributed computation in statistics and machine learning under constraints for, of privacy, communication, and efficiency. He won the Meta or the Facebook PhD fe research fellowship and has been selected as a social and ethical responsibility of computing scholar by MIT's Wurzman College of Computing. He was interviewed in the book, Data Scientist, the Definite Guide to Becoming a Data Scientist, and his work on split learning was featured in techno uh, Technology Review. He was previously a scientist at Apple, Amazon, Motorola Solution, Public Engines, Quarnery, and various starts, uh, startups, all of which were eventually acquired. So without further ado, let's welcome Pranice for his talk. Thank you, Hangzi. Um, yeah, I was uh, delighted to see this uh, uh, symposium series. So this talk is, a, so I have a background in statistics and computing. So there's a talk at a good intersection of both of these topics. Um, and uh, before I further ado, it's all about private measuring correlations um, between different data variables in a private fashion. So let me start with some food for thought. Um, consider like uh, a very specific kind of a device that collects a very specific kind of a data modality. Uh, so let's consider the IR camera. Um, and the primary purpose of this device is to measure like the, the body temperature um, in, in public locations where there's a lot of crowding. Uh, but if you think about it, um, what, what could be potentially inferred from this data goes way beyond just body temperature. Right? So you could infer the gait of the person, you can infer the gender of the person, you can infer the heart rate, heart rate variability, um, if the person is sleepy or is he feeling active. You can, you can infer a lot about the, people, the person in this data. So this is just one device in a very specific modality in a specific situation. But in the real world, what's happening is like, you know, you kind of telescope this off into like a bigger proportion. There's a ton of kind of devices different kinds of devices, and you also have different kinds of data modalities that they're dealing with. At the same time, there's many different ways of communication or like communication topologies they involve in. They interact in very different forms. You can have like a centralized server where all the small devices are reporting to the server. You can have like peer-to-peer -peer situation where devices are communicating themselves as if, as if, as if they were on a social network. Um, so there, these are these intelligent ubiquitous devices doing P2P data sharing. Um, and you can have many other kinds of topologies. At the same time, in this distributed world of many kinds of devices, uh, there's also the concern of privacy. So um, often these two come together um, and kind of materialize in a situation where there ends up being a trade-off in terms of how much utility you can squeeze out of your data and how resource efficient you can uh, have your devices function in order to gather this utility. At the same time, having a constraint of uh, pr uh, protecting privacy. So to summarize, how could we effectively enable you know, individuals and organizations and at different national and global levels to collaborate through uh, seamlessly through data and intelligence sharing without infringing the privacy uh, of, the, of the people involved um, that are giving you this data? And how do you incentivize this? Like, is there like a market, for example, thinking forward for data? Like, is there something about a data market just, we have, just like we have markets for um, you know, physical goods like in Amazon? Uh, how do you incentivize this whole process as well? So the bigger trade-off that showcases or materializes in these scenarios is the trade-off of, uh, on one hand, you have like data being siloed and distributed across different places, which you cannot gather and centralize in one data center. The reason you cannot do that is uh, primarily privacy concerns. You cannot just give everyone's data and put in like one God's data center and assume that you can uh, do all your processing in there. So you, you have distributed data that is siloed. You have like a privacy constraint. And at the same time, on the other side, you want to squeeze as much utility out of your data while still preserving the privacy. So there is some friction here, like there's some dichotomy. So how do we, how do we, you know, push the barriers in this scenario where you can preserve the privacy and start getting more utility? You want to be on the top right. Uh, 
And this is real business, even from a monetary perp. Um, I mean, by real real business, I mean, I literally mean this like, uh, this, has, this has real monetary consequences um, in terms of breaches and uh, privacy being protected. It's just not from an ethical standpoint, it's also from a commercial standpoint. So there's, there's a ton of breaches that we keep hearing about, and this is just a sampling of those, uh, just to give you an idea of the scale of it. And this is just within healthcare, within a specific set of companies. And this is by no means uh, all inclusive, right? The scale of it is much bigger than what's in the slide. Um, as you see, most of these breaches are in, in millions of victims, uh, data being breached. And even if you code whatever, the $6 is not uh, somebody's number, it's just my magic number. Even if you put like a small amount, like $6 per person, uh, in terms of uh, the penalty involved per, per person in the breach, you're, you're gonna see like, you multiply this with anything, you're gonna see like million, hundreds of millions of dollars. So this is like a big issue. At the same time, the, the even bigger issue is beyond the monetary costs, you have like ethical, moral, legal trust issues uh, that follow up uh, regardless of the monetary cost. And, and there's a lot of uh, you know, bad news and PR repercussions as well. So this is, a, this, is, this is the follow up effects of having a privacy breach, for example. At the same time, some of the industries are, uh, are regulated with higher requirements of privacy. Some industries are less regulated regardless of breach is a breach. Uh, and and uh, it doesn't matter whether the privacy of a, of, a, of a person from one strata has been breached or versus, a, versus a, a privacy from some other geography has been breached, it's still privacy per person. Um, so that's where this whole field of distributed and private computation come together. And these are, this is like a sampling slide. Um, it's a little old of the kinds of projects uh, um, me and my group have been working in. Um, so we have some projects on distributed machine learning, how do you train machine learning models in a distributed setup. Um, we have introduced something called split learning as an alternate to another popular paradigm called federated machine learning. At the same time, we worked on purely privacy projects at the intersection of ML. Like how do you share um, representations of your, of say image data that you squeeze from some model with some privacy guarantees. Um, we worked on some early proof of concepts at the intersection of say wireless computing and formal privacy guarantees for doing machine learning. So for example, this project is very early proof of concept, but it, it kind of tries to do over the air computation. So you can, um, decide, if you have wireless devices communicating, you can, uh, just modulate the transmission powers of these de different devices because it's just like your TV from back in the day where you're using like an antenna long, long ago. If you're not having a, a good transmission power or like a good receiving uh, standpoint, um, you are introducing some obfuscation to the data. So can we, you know, introduce obfuscation into the data just by modulating the transmission uh, power of these different devices in addition to the channel noise in order to cause some uh, privacy benefits? while still trying to preserve some utility to do ML, for example. Today's talk is the bottom left one, which is more at the intersection of statistics of how we could measure correlations between data sets with privacy guarantees. You could also extend it, I guess, for doing hypothesis testing uh, with privacy, um, so on and so forth. We've come up with some architectures to do purely empirical work to prevent reconstruction attacks on images, so can you, while, while still being able to squeeze some utility out of the representations you're sharing and so on and so forth. So this is the guiding question. Now trying to focus on just the main part of the talk now. Um, so the guiding question, how do we measure correlation or correlations between say like socioeconomic data, which is kind of sensitive and also disease status, which is also sensitive. Um, um, it could also be more mortality status, but uh, I'm putting the socioeconomic bucket and the, the disease or mortality bucket variables, and you can think of many kinds of variables uh, and data sets that would fall in these categories, and both of them are literally sensitive. And how could one organization interact with another organization holding the other kind of data without leaking their privacy and still be able to estimate what their correlations are in order to make some downstream decision making based on these measurements. So some starter solutions, um, which are, so for example, from left to right, you could do something on device, um, but then uh, that is not a solution because the data is distributed. You have a bunch of variables with one client and the other variable is with another client. So we're not talking of a situation where all the data set is with one client and you wanna measure the correlations for some exploratory data analysis. We're looking at two different clients where the data literally is distributed across both clients. So client one has socioeconomic data, client two has disease data. You can anonymize, that's a reasonable starter, but, but then uh, it's not that reasonable when you think about it. 
um, because there's been a ton of breaches that have shown that just anonymization is not enough and that could leak and breach privacy. So moving towards a more higher complexity of solution, you could do some sort of obfuscation. Uh, this bucket is about adding noise at different parts of the pipeline. It could be early on to the data. It could be somewhere to some objective you're optimizing, or it could be that after the query that you processed before you release the answer. Regardless, add noise at the right point in order to get some formal guarantee of some formal definition of privacy, which is very popular um, and established that it's known as differential privacy. And again, needless to say, there's most solutions come with a privacy utility trade-off unless it's a, a very unique query in a very unique setting. So the game is all about trying to squeeze more utility while preserving the privacy. And talking of some sort of guarantees, can we do this with some sort of a sublinear error rate? Um, sublinear in terms of say, uh, either the sample size or like the dimension of your data, so on and so forth. I'll make it more exact in terms of what kind of sublinear guarantees we can give. Uh, because you don't want to add noise and uh, in proportion to uh, in, in a very great proportion to the number of samples you have in your data set and you might end up your error having to depend on that uh, amount of noise depending on the number of samples which would lead to your error reducing very uh, or error blowing up very quickly with respect to your sample size you don't want to have that you want to have to error to grow up very slowly with respect to sample size or with respect to dimension and so on and so forth so one thing I don't have to sell as much is the fact that correlations has become, the word correlation has become such a uh, fundamental word that people even use it in non-technical settings. It's just uh, becoming more and more uh, commonly used words that has gone from science into like a more day-to-day uh, -day use case. People talk of correlations in various contexts and even within science and engineering, it is certainly a, a, a very fundamental aspect. So, so, so the reason for even more the reason for being able to measure them in a distributed setup with privacy. So, to be clear, the problem we're talking about is the one in the right. So, you could have like a single party private correlation problem where all the variables that you're dealing with is on a single database on a single client. And then some courier can say, what is the correlation between some variable X and Y, but give me the correlation while preserving the privacy of this data set. We're talking more about the distributed setup. So in the simplest setup, it would be the two-party correlation problem. You have a set of features or data variables, say X on client one, this could be socioeconomic data. You could have paired data, which is say health data of the same people. So these are paired data, uh, corresponding data, but there's a different kind of variable though. This is health data on another client. And say client two would like to know what is the correlation of its data set of its health data with the socioeconomic data that is held hosted on client one. And how do you preserve the privacy? Um, we can even simplify this setup a little bit and say client two would like to know the answer, but it would never reveal the answer. At the same time, it needs to interact with client one because what it needs, uh, some of the data is with client one, which is X. So it, it, needs, it needs to ensure, both, both parties need to ensure that the privacy of X is preserved. Uh, any communication that happens is one way. So uh, the communication needs to be private and then the client who gets the answer after that. And the North Star is, can we even aim for like sublinear error in something? We'll, 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 I'll tell you more about in what. Uh, at the same time, the fact that if you could solve the private nonlinear correlation problem in this distributed setups, it ends up being a root problem or like some sort of a central problem uh, whose solution um, so for which the, the solutions to many other problems, downstream problems, hinges on having a solution to this root problem. So if you can solve this original problem, you would end up getting solutions for many other important problems in statistics or data sciences. For example, as a sampling, you could uh, talk about the multi-party hypothesis testing problem to test whether data in one client is independent from a data in another client, but you need to come up with some sort of confidence bands in order to make those decisions, as opposed to just measuring the dependency and saying, this is how much they're correlated, but you don't know if you can still declare independence or not, um, because it really depends on what is the size of data, what is this distribution of the data that you don't know, uh, and many other aspects. You could also uh, start having solutions. If you have for the root problem, you could have a solution for, say, like uh, trying to figure out the causal direction between one single variable and another variable uh, while preserving privacy. And it's good to say that causal inference is a huge field in itself. So I'm not saying it solve all the problems in there, 
but in this specific setting of having two variables at a time, if you want to figure out the direction, uh, if your estimator for the direction is from X to Y or from Y to X being the causal nature, you could do that with privacy. Um, you could have some sort of graphical models that you could use to do private data synthesis. So you don't want to release the data, but you want to synthesize some data that represents the private data set. Uh, how could you do that? That also hinges on being able to know what the correlations are, because these algorithms need that in order to seed it, um, even to run them. At the same time, you could do some sort of feature selection or feature screening, which is the problem of selecting which variables are relevant and uh, diverse for some task at hand, so on and so forth. And this is just a root problem within data sciences. But if you bring in more domain specific areas, say like healthcare, um, you can have more domain specific problems that also hinge on being able to measure correlations while preserving privacy. Uh, for example, there is a field called imaging genomics which is all about trying to figure out correlations between imaging data, healthcare medical imaging data, and um, genome expressions, uh, data generated from genome expressions. So, so on and so forth. So let me just give you the high level aha of how the scheme works, and then we'll get into a little more details and the ifs and buts around it. So the main idea is to take your raw data sets, so the X and Y we were talking about, socioeconomic data and health data, and you construct some uh, relational information between the rows in your data set, which can be, you know, described using graph Laplacians or, uh, or covariance matrices of this data. And once you have this relational information, you can perform some sort of random projections of these matrices. And then we can show that the nonlinear correlation that you would like to measure is also a function of these covariances, for example. So you basically measure these covariances, you randomly project those covariances, and then you get these uh, projected covariances, and then you measure the nonlinear correlation as a function of these privatized co uh, covariances. Um, and you don't have to add any more explicit noise once you do the random projection. The random projection itself introduces a lot of um, noising into the process in order to cause privacy. Uh, and this kind of an approach leads to a sublinear error in um, basically sublinear in the sample in the in the dimension of your data set. So it, it's a sample size independent bound, which is great. And the error also grows sublinearly, only logarithmically in the dimension of your data. Epsilon is a popular parameter that people use to uh, indicate the level of privacy you're looking for. So this is like a high level picture, but there's you know like a lot of buzzwords and jargons in the slide. So let's slow down at this point and see what's going on a little more. So Let's think of a starter non-private solution uh, in order to measure nonlinear correlation. And what do we mean by nonlinear correlation? There are many measures of correlation in statistics and information theory. One of the correlations that, uh, for the sake of specificity that we deal with is called a distance correlation. I'll share second order details of what this does later on, but the high level idea of estimating the distance correlation is as follows. You could either use a off-the-shelf distance co correlation estimator to estimate the correlation between X and Y, but the problem is X and Y are siloed in a distributed setting. So what we could do is we can, instead of just sharing X and Y together at the same time, we would like to do some sort of a post-processing of X and Y and share that processed version so that the correlations can be computed on the process version. So what is the post-processing you're talking about? You take the data set X and Y. These pictures, by the way, are just cartoon representations. Don't try to read through what's happening on the points. Um, this is not real data. So this is just the idea for the scheme. So what you could do is you take X and Y. So you take socioeconomic data and perform a random projection. So you just hit it with a random matrix of a lower dimension. It could be as low as like projecting all the data into just 2D or like 1D, uh, like you see in these pictures. You do the same thing um, with the data on Y as well, which is the healthcare data. You perform a random projection. And then you measure the nonlinear correlation, the distance correlation using off the shelf estimator between this random projected data. Instead of the raw data, you're measuring distance correlation between this random projected data. And then in order to compensate for the fact that you're reducing the dimension after the random projection, you need to be able to do this many, many times. So you do this random projection, say like K times, maybe K is, depends on the problem, say K is a thousand times, and you would measure these nonlinear correlations a thousand times, and you average those nonlinear correlations. This has already been shown, this is a non-private setting, right? There's no privacy guarantee I've given you here. Uh, this has already been shown that 
this average of distance correlations measured on random projected data is an unbiased estimator. Um, so in expectation, it measures the real correlation that you are looking for, the nonlinear correlation. At the same time, it also has a tight deviation around the true answer. So the estimated correlation doesn't deviate from the true correlation. Um, so that's the omega bar minus omega with high probability doesn't deviate much. Um, and it's basically saying the right hand side term, which is the exponential in the bottom bound, um, very quickly uh, steeps towards a small number, which means there is no, there is a very low probability um, that this deviation exceeds epsilon. So people call these concentration bounds or high probability bounds where the concentration is kind of steeping very quickly. You can have upper bounds and lower bounds, uh, or you could have like both sides, like an absolute value bound. Uh, but basically the higher picture is this random projections and averages uh, of the correlations on random projections is a, a, is a great start for a non-private estimator in a distributed setup. But this has been done already, but we're, we're talking about private now. So how do we get privacy now, say for this scheme, for the previous scheme that you saw? You do the same thing, you get random projections, but before you take the average of noisy correlations measured between random projected X and Y, what you do is uh, you add some noise to the random projection. There's some edit to noise. Um, and then you would get this slightly modified estimator, which is you perform a random projection, you transpose X, you perform a random projection, we transpose Y, you do that K times. But to each random projection, just on the X side, because we are doing one-way communication from client one to client two, only the communication that's going from client one that holds X adds some additive noise. Um, now this would guarantee privacy, but under some specific mode of operating it. So one mode of operating it is to know how, what is the privacy guarantee and to exactly know in order to achieve that privacy guarantee, what is the amount of noise that needs to be added. At the same time, once you add noise, like I said, there's the utility privacy trade-off. So as you keep adding noise and you wanna squeeze some utility out of the data, you, you, you cannot go with as much noise as you want because if you just swoop it with a ton of uh, noise, you would lose any, any, any signal in the data. So you won't have any utility. You would have only privacy at that point. So you wanna have like this good trade-off between having a low error of what you wanna really estimate while still knowing uh, what is the minimum amount of noise in order to achieve privacy. So what is the privacy guarantee? So there's the three questions, right? Differential privacy is what we're aiming for. And uh, what is differential privacy in one line? It's basically saying, if you have some raw data X, let's call it a database X. And if you have any neighboring database in which only one record changes, let's call that X prime. So if you have like a neighboring database, um, and then you apply some algorithm that you're supposed to uh, privatize. So you have some query. So in our case, it's the co correlation. So let's call that algorithm the M of X. So M is what you would like to privatize. So your, al your algorithm to measure correlation M of X is gonna be differentially private if the probability of uh, the, if the PDF or the probability distribution of the output of your algorithm doesn't change much. Um, as, as So E par epsilon is a very small number because epsilon is gonna be less than one. So it's a very small number. Um, and delta is a kind of a slack factor. It's another small number that says when the privacy doesn't hold. So typically your delta has to be very small. Um, so this is the definition of differential privacy. Differential privacy is a definition of the uh, notion of privacy. It's not an algorithm in itself. So one needs to come up with algorithms or mechanisms and then be able to show that their algorithm is differentially private with so on so and so parameters and uh, so and so procedures. And as long as they can show that their algorithm satisfies this definition, then it's differentially private. What does this mean? You know, this prevents something called the membership inference attack, where if X, like I said, X and X prime are neighboring databases. So if X had a million records and X prime has only one record different than the other million records, it's a neighboring database. Uh, even then you cannot infer anything about this new record that was changed between X and X prime uh, because the PDFs would look very similar with or without its presence. Whether you have this new record or not, there wouldn't be much difference in the probability distribution of the output of your queries. So it'll be hard to say, because if your query output changed very quickly, you can infer maybe this person belongs to a particular race or a gender or a particular age or whatever the data set is about. But if it's not sensitive at all, to neighboring databases, then it's hard to infer what's different about this person regardless of the output of your query. Uh, 
So that's the intuitive uh, one way of uh, getting the intuition behind what differential privacy is guaranteeing. So the second question is how much noise needs to be added? So we have, so the differential privacy is parameterized by epsilon and delta, right? That's the level of privacy that someone's shooting for. So depending on the user's choice of epsilon and delta, this is the amount of noise you need to add. And we have some constant W as well that we tell you how to derive it. And when you do that, so where are we adding this noise? We're adding to the random projection. You're projecting your data and adding some noise before you measure the correlations. And then we're saying it's private. So that's where you add the noise. And then the guarantee we get that we derive is as follows. It's like in a high probability bound or like a concentration bound that basically says with very low probability, um, the error would, um, uh, you, you basically have an upper bound in the error basically. So the error is always going to be lesser than this upper bound um, with the, uh, with with, the, with a very high probability, or it doesn't it doesn't uh, miss satisfy it with the low probability. So the probability is tight. This term is the probability term. This is tight in a sense that it uh, narrows down very quickly as we need. Um, at the same time, you can analyze the upper bound. So your error is always going to be less than something that depends on epsilon and delta, the privacy level the user was shooting for. It depends on uh, sample size, but there's an N square and the N square below. So it doesn't depend much on the sample size. It kind of cancels out. And also the N, N you would have some linear N terms depending in the denominator, which is in your favor, because you want this bound to be as small as possible so that you can say the error is smaller. If your upper bound is small, your error is small. At the same time, it depends on the dimension of your original data set. So are you dealing with million uh, dimensional data like in genomics or are you dealing with uh, hundreds of uh, data columns, um, like in some other socioeconomic data. So D is the dimension of X, M is the dimension of Y. And uh, so here it depends. So more dimension is, is gonna give you a little more harder time in getting a lower upper bound. At the same time, uh, N is not much of a factor. And then uh, it also depends on the dimension into which you're projecting your data. Because you're doing random projections, that's a small K. If you're projecting into a much larger dimension, it will give you lesser error, which makes sense because if I project too much, I'm losing the structure in my data, which means my utility in measuring the correlation uh, is gonna hurt. Um, because it seems fair enough to think that if you take a million dimensional data set X and a million dimensional data set Y, and I project it into one dimension, so I take million columns and convert it into one column data, obviously it's very likely that you lose some utility in measuring the correlation between the original data sets. So this K de decides how, how much you're projecting it into. Uh, at the same time, the capital K measures how many random projections you're doing because we're taking averages of projected correlations after noise. Um, but then let's not settle for mediocre. Maybe we want to have some sort of sublinear error that I was trying to shoot for um, in, in some sense. So ideally I want some error that doesn't depend on sample size and also estimation error that uh, grows sublinearly with respect to uh, in specific the dimension into which um, uh, in which in which your data set lies. So this is a high-level strategy. I won't go too deep into it. Um, so inspired by Game of Thrones, it's important to know uh, what your allies are. So if you have, there are many sub hammers and your own hammers you're creating to solve a problem or like hit a nail, you need to know which are the allies so that you get a path from going from X to Y, right? You need to squeeze out an answer in some form. So this is the one way to get like sublinear error as opposed to the random projection approach that we've also proposed. So you have the raw data set, the approach that I'm proposing, this is the AHA slide I'm expanding on, which was prior to the random projection. Uh, this is the first thing I was pointing towards in order to get sublinear error, which is your distance correlation or distance covariance can be expressed as a function of a Laplacian. We show that, a graph Laplacian, which measures neighborhood structure between your samples and your data. And there are measures to, there are various mechanisms to privatize graph Laplacians, but then how much is the error in using these private Laplacians it depends on what you want to do with it. So if you want to do some sort of graph cut queries, you get some amount of error. If you want to solve something called the directional variance query, all these are queries that depend on this in the middle stream. So you have the, you have the upstream, you have this middle stream private operation, and then these are the downstream solution uh, things that depend on the private Laplacian. So if you do if you do whatever query you want, you, you will not necessarily have sublinear error. But if you did some of these specific kind of queries that depend on private Laplacians, you would have sublinear error. But the good thing is we also show that one of these specific queries, downstream queries called the directional variance, variance query, uh, can be used to explicitly used to explicitly um, 
uh, denote the nonlinear correlation when a measure. So basically, the nonlinear correlation can be expressed as a directional variance. The directional variance can be expressed as a function of graph Laplacians, but these graph Laplacians can be privatized, and therefore you would have sublinear error. But this is the high-level hand wavy picture, but this is an exact approach um, with uh, many steps to go from one to the other. Uh, now comes some secondary elements. Which I showed you two ways of how to privatize nonlinear correlations in a distributed setting, one with some reasonable error bound and one with a much tighter error bound. The first one was random projection. The second one was the Laplacian approach or like the covariance approach. But then what is this correlation we're measuring? So there's some secondary elements of this uh, topic. Like what does it mean to measure the distance, distance correlation? Why is it a nonlinear correlation? So take, to take a step back, um, there is a specific definition for it for what it means for two random variables to be independent uh, or dependent. So two random variables x and y are said to be independent if their joint probability distribution can be written as a product of their marginal probability distribution. So this is a definition of statistical independence. So this measure, this this term here is measuring how far a joint probability can be marginalized into a product of marginal uh, distributions. So this is measuring how far it is from dependent from independence. So the bigger the number, more the dependence, lesser the number, less the independence. Uh, so toward more the independence. So this term is an unnormalized notion of it, but you can also have a normalized notion where you divide by distance variances, which is just the product of distance covariance of x comma x and x y comma y, just like you have Pearson's correlation in high school, where you have like the numerator and the denominator terms. The denominator is for normalizing it because this term can be greater than or equal to zero, but it's unbounded, but ideally you'd like to have it in a normalized scale. So when you normalize this, this term is the distance covariance. When you normalize it, you get the distance correlation. And that always lies between zero and one, and zero is uh, independence, one is dependence, uh, statistical independence or statistical dependence. So this is the correlation uh, which we were measuring privately through the schemes that I gave you about. Um, then how do I compute it? Because uh, I don't have to do integrals and stuff all the time. On real data, there are estimators. This is a population notion. In order to estimate it, there are other formulas that you could use, which are a lot easier to compute. And when you compute them, you would have a good estimate. If it's a good estimator, you would have a good estimate of this phenomena of distance covariance or distance correlation. And how do these estimators look like? Um, and why is it called distance correlation? Because these estimators, as you see in this box, only depend on Euclidean distances. So you measure the distances between the samples in your data X, you measure distances between all pairs of samples in your data Y, and then you put that into a kitchen sink formula, which is, it just depends on these distances. There's a lot of terms, but every term here just depends on the distances. So that's the reason. You can, just from Euclidean distances, without estimating any probability distributions, you would get, an you would get a measurement for distance correlation, which is a good estimator for this population distance correlation. So this is what happens in, com in computational uh, standpoint. And uh, this formula is uh, biased, but you can have corrections to it, which are also people have come up with, and you'll have an unbiased formula. And uh, people uh, also call uh, this sub area as energy statistics, and it's different from information theory, which is also about measuring, um, um, one of the aspects of information theory is to measure dependence between random variables using many kinds of divergences. But in information theory, typically distances between the uh, distributions are measured through formulas that depend on probabilities, uh, where you really need to estimate the probability distribution. Uh, and if your data set is high dimensional, it's a hard problem to estimate the probability distribution in order to measure the dependence. But the good thing about energy statistics or the distance correlation is you don't have to estimate the problem. You only have to measure the distances, which is a very fairly doable operation. So this is the nature of distance correlation. And whenever I say, I'm measuring distance correlation and adding noise and averaging it. That's the formula you would use. You would measure the distance correlation through some formula of distances on your data set. And then you would project it and you would add noise in order to get the privacy results I showed you. Um, as I said, there's a central problem as a recap. And uh, before I uh, go towards the end of the talk, I just wanted to give a slide or two on one of the central problems, uh, the, one of the sub problems below this root problem. Uh, and why it could potentially be solved. If you privatize this, how could you privatize this problem as well? So this is a problem of independence testing, which is kind of uh, uh, one kind of a hypothesis testing in statistics. And what hypothesis testing in a classical sense depends as follows. What it does is this. So say I wanted to make a decision from my data sets 
of whether these data sets X and Y are independent or not, statistically independent or not. I need to make a decision as opposed to just saying the correlation is so-and-so. Because if I told you the correlation was 0.14, it's low enough, but can I be confident in declaring independence uh, just by looking at 0.14? Maybe it's supposed to be 0.12, I don't know. Maybe it's supposed to be 0.001. Um, it really depends on the data set and what you're shooting for and many other aspects. So that's the jump from just measuring dependencies to going towards independence testing uh, from a statistical standpoint. So the way this classically works, there are many ways to do it, is uh, that people measure something called the test statistic. And they also derive analytical forms of what is the distribution of this test statistic. What is the context or the significance of having a test statistic is the follows. The way they derive the distribution of the test statistic is conditionally dependent on something, which is critical, which is the distribution of the test statistic follows whatever they derive only if the null hypothesis is true. So there are two kinds of hypothesis. Null hypothesis is independence, alternate is not independence. Only if the independence is true, only then that test statistic will satisfy that, this distribution in reality. So they would know the textbook distribution when independence is true. And when they measure the test statistic, they can compare it with their textbook distribution, just like a logarithmic table, you just compare the textbook distribution. Say in reality, if someone measured a real value for a test statistic of this number, and they know the textbook distribution, uh, which would need to hold if independence were true, but if they see that the number lies too much in the tail in an unlikely event, they could use it depending on how much confidence they want and say, it's too unlikely that the test statistic uh, takes this value because if independence were true, it should have taken some value more closer to the mean, for example. But it's too much in the tail, so I would declare to reject independence uh, and so on and so forth, or, or, or the vice versa. This is how the scheme works. But now in order to privatize it, I mean, people have worked a ton on independence testing and hypothesis testing in general, but in order to privatize it, it's an interesting problem. Um, there is one version of a test statistic that solely depends on distance covariances, which is what I presented in the slides so far. Is the numerator of the test statistic depends on that. The denominator again depends on some term that only depends on Euclidean distances. So if you measure, if you can privatize this ratio, then you know this textbook distribution to compare against, and you, and this has nothing to do with raw data. So you can perform independence testing with privacy guarantees. So you can plug in my estimate that I gave you from the numerator, and then for the denominator, we've shown what you need to do privatize it in, in an alternate work, and that will lead you to be able to do private independence testing. Similarly, there are many other problems that directly depend on being able to prioritize this root problem. And hence, I'm kind of making this point that this is a root problem, basically, uh, that needs to be prioritized so that you can get the benefit for other downstream problems. So, yep, that's my closing slide and uh, open to questions or discussions and so on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Pradeep, for your talk. So do we have questions from the audience? Okay, um, hello. So hey. thanks for your talk. Um, can, I, can you go back to the previous slides? Sure. Yeah, I think when, when, when you talk about this, like add noise to the distance, right? The omega x, y, right? Right. So you only add noise to the variable x, so why, why don't you or also add noise to variable y? You could, but there's a reason I don't because I, I came up with a, I, I suggested a communication topology where there's only one way communication. So okay. I'm answering a question where y would like to know what is the correlation of its data with data set x. So the answer can be done on y, but why does it need to reveal the answer? Why can make a decision making in-house inside its client? Okay. Think of it as a buyer who wants to buy data that is relevant to its data, for example. Okay. So say, think of this as a seller. So if I only make X private, the one-way communication gets done, and then yeah. Y will do some more post-processing and it would get the answer, but the post-processing is done on device. But the only communication that's happening from X to Y is the only communication, so that needs to be privatized. Um, that way, the correlation is private, and the client to get its, gets its answer to make in-house decisions. Okay, so is it possible that we add noise after we get the distance, like we calculate the omega x y, and then we add noise? Yeah, there, are, yeah, there, are, there's potential. Typically, there is something called input perturbation where you add to the raw data. They don't do it often for obvious reasons. People, 
well, not obvious for, for specific reasons that the utility should not blow up. Um, people can add intermediate uh, in the intermediate of the pipeline, in the middle of the pipeline. You could also just measure the correlation and then add noise. But the problem mm -hmm. is you could do that only in the single party setting. In the multi-party setting, in the two-party setting, you cannot measure the correlation in the first place without breaching privacy if you okay, do not add noise. So okay. you add noise, protect privacy, then do post-processing at the final answer. Okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Cool. Any other questions? Yes, thanks. Okay. Uh, yeah, so maybe I can also ask questions. So can you go to, uh, let's see, next slide or, so how, do, so basically my question is, I, I still don't really get how to add that noise. So which could you, you know? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. That? yeah, so you basically add, uh, you take, uh, there are many distributions you can choose from. So the mm -hmm. one we chose is like, you just take a noise from a Gaussian distribution uh, with mean zero and uh, standard deviation about this number. So you can, it's oh. very, like, so you might as well okay. use that. So you just take, mm -hmm. that is the amount of noise that's needed. And uh, in order to know these internal parameters, this is a user given parameter, differential privacy. The user says they want epsilon privacy. Lower epsilon is high privacy, higher epsilon is lower privacy. Okay, okay, so it's a standard deviation with the, uh, the Gaussian, yeah. Gaussian, yeah, okay. Yeah, so another, uh, you know, a little bit high level question. Sure. So I feel like, you know, this projection, uh, this step is also kind of, it seems like, you know, uh, because it's not a direct match between the input and the projection, it can lose some accuracy or maybe it can enhance some privacy. Right. You know, so, so, I mean, so is that, you know, is that someone has already done? So let's say we just project the input into a very dense uh, sub, you know, a, vector, a very dense vector. So is that someone has already done that? Yeah, so basically there is this very powerful and uh, very popular result called the JL lemma, Johnson Linden Strauss lemma. Mm -hmm. Kind of magical sometimes uh, to think about it. It says you take any data sets, X and Y, doesn't matter. You just do random projection with some specific kinds of random matrices, uh, but there's many okay. kinds you can choose from. And then the lemma says, as long as you project to uh, a dimension greater than or equal to some dimension that they prescribe, as long as you're not projecting a too low dimension, then all pairs of Euclidean distances after the projection, sorry, before the projection are preserved also after the projection. So it preserves the entire structure, the distance structure in your data set. Uh, even after random projections. It's kind of crazy that it happens that way. Uh, uh, so, so that's why random projections are kind of your friend in many aspects that they preserve the structure of your data. But if, of course, if you're projecting it to too low a dimension, then you're going beyond what the JL lemma can prescribe, is prescribing. So in that case, you need to do other things, maybe like uh, take averages of your estimates, which may be okay in some for some estimates, like for distance correlation, it works out fine. It gives you an unbiased estimator, even if you project to a univariate dimension. Uh, but of course, it will hurt your privacy utility trade off more because more the utility you use in your privacy lose in your privacy scheme, the worse your privacy utility trade off. So you don't necessarily need to project too much. Uh, that's why the K term shows up accordingly. There's a square root dependency. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sounds cool. Uh, do we have other questions? Quick, uh, kind sure. of, again, a high level question. Mm -hmm. Why the focus on um, nonlinear correlation? Yeah, um, linear is too simple. Uh, that's the high level answer, but um, uh, not, not everything is linear. Um, all relationships are not linear in this world. Um, and then, uh, it's not, Pearson correlation is not an absolute measure. So Pearson's correlation is just saying if you did a linear regression, it's showing if it's uh, positively proportional or directly proportional or if it's inversely proportional, but not all relationships are even monotonic. Uh, a good cartoon example would be um, if someone said um, mortality and uh, income are inversely correlated, it doesn't mean that if someone was a billionaire, he would live forever, because that's what your straight line would say. You would say, 
they're inversely correlated with a high linear correlation close to one, for example, it would not mean that you can extrapolate that straight line and say, okay, if someone had more than a six figure salary, this is the amount they can live. But does that mean that if I continue my line, once he's a billionaire, will he live forever? Like, will he reach immortality? He will not, right? Which means naturally relationships are not linear in, in many data variables and data phenomena. You can sometimes make approximations and say they're kind of piecewise linear, they're locally linear, maybe that's reasonable, but you cannot just stretch the line and say this is forever a relationship, like a God-given rule that everything's linear. So that's a, that's a good example of why nonlinear correlations are more realistic. Um, and many functional relationships between variables are nonlinear. So it seems like, you know, you don't believe in the existence of a linear correlation to the extreme. I mean, it's only within the... The utility bounds. of a linear correlation is very limited. Right, right. Okay, got it. Thank right. you. Okay, so do we have other questions? Well, if not, let's, you know, thank you, Pradeep, for this wonderful talk. And yeah, so we will, so we will have another set of talk, you know, after the spring break. So, you know, everyone enjoy your spring break and we will see you uh, two weeks later. Thanks. Hey, thank you very much. This is a wonderful symposium. Appreciate it. Yeah.